he was quite rare, Cedric Morris, in the fact that he appointed the gardener's executor when he died to sort of give away all of his plants. So what remained were basically were, were species bulbs, which he was really into. And it was so exciting. So every morning I would go out, you know, with my tea or whatever and, and walk, walk sort of barefoot through the garden and slowly find, oh, wow, there's an ornithogallum there or there's an amazing scari there. I wanted to talk about these because it's a space that I've been absolutely battling with for, for years. This is the first year where the space has actually worked. So logistically, uh, I'm just going to warn you, if you're going to get things out of the vase, Dan Cooper has realised that you need a towel on your lap. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 88 of Talking Dirty. Over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, looking totally tropical, is Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome, very tanned horticulturalist. Well, that's the tan is from being outside. I think as much as anything, it's probably windburn. But there we are over in Cambridgeshire on this wonderfully sunny morning. And I hear that it's even warm in cold Aston. More of that later. We have thought of Maria Sophia Fredrickson, everybody. It is wonderfully warm and it is warm in cold Aston, where one of our Talking Dirty favourites is back on the podcast, organic gardener and award winning garden writer, Valerie Iris Bourne. How are you? I am in terrific form. Whoa. I'm really, I, I was born on the hottest day of the year and I'm a twin and my mother never let me forget it. <laughs> so I love hot weather and I hate cold weather. And I still keep thinking about the holiday in Croma last August when I came <laughs> to your garden, Alan, dressed up like a... Doing your yeah, best Eskimo yeah. impression, huddled yeah. up, bundled I've up. I've somewhere further south this year. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you visit Alan's garden at the moment, it is tropical, you're fine. <laughs> yes. We've still actually had quite a lot of cold wind here, but in the garden itself with our shelter belts, I mean, visitors have been amazed day upon day upon day. Of, of saying, well, uh, even the postman arrived. I was walking out, uh, working in the front courtyard. He said, "How warm is it in here to out there?" Yes, <laughs> shelter belts. Well, we don't have any of that because we've got this view on top of the Cotswolds that stretches over the fields, and um, I don't like to block it off. No, but it's, we've had really cold nights here. You need some of Alan's little windows in the hedge so you can peer oh, out. Yes, yes. yes. very Roy Strong. <laughs> now Val I know that you because you're very organic and you're environmentally focused with your gardening which is wonderful um you're you're you know into watering containers as you have to be or else they'll perish but you always talk about the rest of the garden having to get on with it how does your garden cope in weather like this well it, it copes pretty well really because we're called spring cottage and part of the garden does have spring water that is running some distance underneath the ground and then in the places that are dry, I just grow drought tolerant plants like Achilles and all, all sorts of silver leaf things. And um, uh, I find that um, uh, the things the South African plants like dioramas, they do very well here against the south facing wall, as long as they've got their feet under paving because cool. they like to have a cool root run. So I've got lots of drought tolerant things in the garden. Um, the worst bit of the garden, actually, is um, the autumn border because you get plants that you used to rely on, like Helianthus lemon queen. And some years they do and some years they don't. You know, it's too dry for them because mm. they they have to get to a certain height before they flower. So they need good growing conditions. So I, I don't know whether I'll have to redesign that bit of the garden and put more drought tolerant things in. I'm not sure. I think there's a great possibility that we will have to re rethink how we garden because of the, the various droughts that we're having, because we, we never, ever used to have dry springs. And now every year it seems it's to dry. Yeah. Yes, it is. It's it's dry. Dry. We used to have that lovely warm rain, shower, April showers and good growing conditions to get everything going. And now we don't. No, it's, to it's a totally different climate. You are absolutely right. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons that my garden survives dry conditions here, because we are south facing, we get light all the way through the day in the summer, Lovely. is because I plant densely. So yeah. I have always belonged to this shoehorn school of gardening where I'm buying plants and shoving them in. <laughs> and you can't see the soil by about early May, all the gaps have gone and it's it's a canopy of plants, which is what I like. 
You know, I like that abundance. And yeah. that keeps the moisture in. And I was watching a blackbird this morning, diving in and out of the borders, coming out with little grubs and worms, perfectly happy because, you know, in amongst the, underneath all that canopy, there's a lot of life going on. And that helps the organic gardener tremendously because it helps your colonies of ground beetles. And they're some of the best predators in the garden. So I think it's very much about the way you garden as well. I think it's also... Um, tantamount to the fact that if there's no gaps, you don't get so many weeds because if yes. there's gaps, light can get to mm. the soil, then weed seeds will germinate. And perhaps they'll be germ they may still, may still germinate in the dark, but they won't grow as well. No, they don't germinate as well. And it's mm. funny, if you get a gap in a border, um, we've got quite a lot of quite pernicious, pernicious weeds here because it's such an old garden. And things like field bindweed and bindweed go down so deep that you can dig down, and you don't find the roots. And if there's a, you suddenly find yourself with a gap where something hasn't grown very well, you'll find that you've got the bindweed coming up <laughs> in that particular gap where the light is falling. And oh. all you can do is pull it out. I can't poison weeds, so I just, I just go around and tug it out. And then in the winter, I try and get it out physically, but I, I can't get it out. It's so deep down into the ground that I don't find the roots. Not just that, but if you do find the roots and you leave one tiny minuscule piece behind, that will start a new plant. Yes, absolutely will. I think one of the tips I give people if you've got a weedy garden, and the best beloved argued, and I argued about this because he wanted to rotivate it, and I said, no, you'll chop it up and it'll be worse. Actually, it wasn't worse because when you were digging and clearing, you were bringing up fragments of root and you could get rid of them. Mm. So it, did, it did, does actually work for people who, who don't use toxins. I'll tell you another little tip if you don't use toxins. This is really for the greater bindweed, and it works here very, very well. We had, well, we bought some hedging plants, and the hedging plants came from Italy, and they had the greater bindweed in the plot, in the pot. Lovely. So, so to everybody from Italy, I'd like to say a huge thank you from East Rustmore Vicarage for your generosity. <laughs> <laughs> however, however um, our way of dealing with it was purely and simply was discovered by accident. We planted the hedge and we mulched. Yes. And we mulched heavily. Now, about four inches deep with uh, mushroom compost. And this bind, greater bindweed, it sort of marched along under this mulch and then popped its head up. And yes. it was terribly easy then to pull it because yes. it's just beneath the mulch. Yes. And over a period of years, we have lessened it. We haven't got rid of it completely. And no. like, like you, Val, I think we probably never will, but no. um, it's just a matter of keeping on top of it. And if you do pull anything's head off every day or every week or yes. every month, you will weaken it. Yeah, you'll worry it to death. Yes! <laughs> <laughs> Terrier. So many people listening and watching will completely sympathise with you, Val, because as plantaholics, especially as most of us don't have 32 acres, we're always trying to cram as much well, into our garden. Don't mention his 32 acres. <laughs> Even Lily's upset. <laughs> you set the dog up. She wants your 32 acres as well. <laughs> But I think um, one problem I have as a much newer gardener, it, or I, I'm doing it less now, but in the past I would put things in and they just get crowded out. So now, you know, if I buy a new grass and it's not very big, I'll try to grow it on a bit before I put it in to yeah, that's a good fight, fight mm. with the other plants. But I think that's a real um, kind of mistake you can make if you're a newer gardener and you yeah. want to get all the plants in is obviously think... the more boisterous ones sort of pound down the, the less boisterous ones. I think the other huge thing about weeding is a lot of people go out in the spring and they see the weeds and they, you know, they fork them and disturb the soil. If you can wait for a wet day and just pull them, you don't disturb the soil because once you disturb the soil, you bring the seed bank to the surface. Yeah. And we're getting a lot of weed. You mentioned the bindweed. Mm -hmm. I never had herb, um, Robert, uh, that herb willow thing what do you call oh, it? Okay, willow herb willow herb thank you and and it comes in on nurserymen's pots because nurserymen nowadays they leave their plants and then they pull the weeds out just before they bring them to a plant sale and the seed is in there and i've had two or three weeds that i never had that i know have must have come in on plants and they're a real mm -hmm. nuisance but i uh, nurserymen are very busy yeah <laughs> It's probably doing a lot of watering as well. And, of, the climate. and of course, the, the bonus is you probably will get some weed seeds come in, but you will also possibly get something interesting turn up 
in a pot from a good nursery man. Wow. And that's as always I did. my... As I did. <laughs> but I bought some seed from Blackwell Seeds um, uh, of something or other. I think it was it was um, a Shizanthus. And this one sort of seedling came up and I thought, you're, you're a um, um, busy Lizzie. And yes. I thought, mm, I'm going to have to grow this on to see what happened. Yes. And it's, it's one of the Sardinii types. And it's, it's, I've got the mauve Sardinii and yeah. this is a paler version of it. It's not yes. really very exciting, but it was, it was a gift, you know, from above, if you like. <laughs> yes. Well, <laughs> the very fun. funny thing is I, I was going to talk about agapanthus today because we grow up pots and agapanthus and in our meadow we have um uh, dactylorhiza hybrids which i bought from a nursery and i planted them and they're doing really well and i've had one or two seeds in the garden but the majority of seeds that have come up in my garden have come up in my tubs of agapanthus <laughs> uh, and i mentioned this um uh to someone and i can't think who it was now and they said that they nearly all their tubs of agapanthus had got dactylorhiza orchid seedlings in. And then I mentioned it to another friend and she said, well, when I used to get plants from Tin Penny Plants, which is Elaine Horton's nursery, which was in Gloucestershire, she said, I always got orchid seedlings coming up. So they obviously position themselves in these warm places and agapanthus pots are warm. And the one place we've had a wild bee orchid come up unfortunately is the very spot that my ginger cat Frank likes to make a crop circle on <laughs> so I've had to put an upturned an upturned sort of hanging basket which is what I use hanging baskets for I don't use plant them anymore I use them as plant cloches to keep yeah. cats and things off so it's quite funny that these orchid seedlings were all in the agapanthus when you're trying so hard to get them seed in other places <laughs> I do feel like growing just tons of agapanthus in pots in the hope that I can get some dactylorhizas in there. I am a dactylorhiza free zone, sadly, at the moment in my garden. Oh. I clearly need to do something about it. Yes. Well, I've got an, an amazing one with very black spotted foliage, which has also got a frank cover over it. <laughs> <laughs> and the place to get your hanging baskets from is Wilco. <laughs> the cheapest place for hanging baskets that you can use as plant poshes. You mentioned agapanthus. Does that mean there's some agapanthus in your show? No, I was, I was going to talk about um, the plants in my meadow at one stage, but I couldn't um, bear to pick any dactylorhiza. Good. But, um, would you like me to start with meadows? You start, you start with whatever you want. Well. Because it will all be fabulous. Yes, okay. <laughs> well, I might start actually. Um, with umbellifers, oh. because um, umbellifers are really good news for natural gardeners, um, because they have this arrangement of flowers. And this one here um, is an annual called Olaya grandiflora. And it's uh, quite tall, about, it's about three foot tall here, flowers very, very early. And it self seeds. And if you look at the seed head, you can see why it self seeds. Mm. I have to take probably nine out of 10 out. I do save seed for other places, but um, the seeds are big brown. They almost look like wood lice with hooks. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they, I'm sure Frank, my ginger cat, will be um, distributing them. Yes, so don't I'm let your cat it. or dog go near them because if Lily, my cockapoo, goes near them, I mean, that is worse than any They're very stiff Lily. them. They're one of the favourite cut flower plants and people arrange them with um, sweet peas. And as the cut flower ladies like them, the seed companies are producing taller and taller ones with stronger and stronger stems. And I, th I think part of the charm of a lot of umbellifers is their structural stem uh, arrangement, which is so architectural. Hmm. So this is a good one. And it, it also attracts bees and butterflies. And it's got the ray petals. And these are the the ones, the petals, the tiny flowers have um, the pollen and the nectar in. And these are very hoverfly friendly. And if you're a natural gardener, you want to encourage hoverflies in your garden because they lay eggs near colonies of aphids. And then the little maggot-like larvae eat your aphids. So I'm always looking for good hoverfly plants. And umbellifers are extremely good um, hoverfly plants. And I think I bought this the other day. I'm going to have to get up. I'm sorry. And um, this is actually a, a Cecily and it's Hippomarathrum. 
and it flowers slightly later um, and it has a pink head of flowers um, which one of them has got broken in the car but never mind that is going <laughs> to plant sales in a nutshell isn't it uh, the roots are the important thing Val yeah uh, and, and, and this is very good in quite um, tightly planted borders because it will uh, produce this lovely um, almost crisp uh, feathery foliage and then these long stems um, and, and they sort of have shades of pink in the flower, but they'll be around in July and August. Yeah, um, that's what I was just going to say that they set the race of plants called Cecily, the umbrella for Cecily. Yes. They spread the, the flowering period because lots of them flower at, at a later time, if you like. Yes. And, and the, most umbellifers are early, aren't they? So yeah. it's nice to have some late ones to attract these tiny little hoverflies. There's one that when I drive through the Brex, I notice on the roadsides, the verges, it's very tall and it's very like a very refined cow parsley, but with much stouter stems. Well, it, I, that's difficult because umbellifers are difficult in the wild. You get a lot of wild carrot over there mm. in, in, the East, in East Anglia, but it could be something like hedge parsley. Um, could be, yes. We have stopped on many a roadside and uh, keyed out an umbellifer in our time because the best beloved is a botanist, not a gardener, <laughs> sadly, but a botanist. But um, it's time, you see, hoverflies, even the quite big hoverflies have tiny mouths and they can't manage lots of different flowers. So to have umbellifers is really good. But people don't always realise... Um, that there are lots of plants that are umbellifers that don't actually look like umbellifers. And this, I didn't <laughs> pick my really nice syringiums. This is a Ringium giganteum. And this is actually an umbellifer. And it has the rough of brats, which so many umbellifers have a rough of some sort. And then this thimble of tiny flowers, which is very good for bumblebees, but also you will get hoverflies going on it as well. And at the moment, my Oryngiums are fantastic. I've got a lot of blue ones and Hillier's produced one called Blue Waves. And I'll send you a picture of this. And it was developed from, it was, the root was, it came from Dove Cottage Garden up in near Sheffield, Shibnall, where they film um, Gentleman Jack actually. And um, it's a wonderful nursery. And if you go there in the summer, um, there's a wonderful garden, but I'm never there at the right time, so I haven't seen it, but people tell me about it. <laughs> and they let their Oryngiums hybridise and sell seed, and they passed on 11 seedlings to Hilliers, and they selected this one called Blue Waves, which is amazing. And it's got some, um, probably some Bagatii in it and Alpinum. And those are really, really good bee plants, and they're just beginning to colour up now. They sort of go from sea green right through to cobalt blue. And they are just so wonderful. And some of mine are made clumps, you know, two or three feet wide. I still can't bear to pick a picture of flat of flower. <laughs> well, it's funny, so, um, I think, I think that one is one I was so lucky to go to York Gate recently and uh, for the first time. And I walked past this wonderful planting and said to Ben Preston, what is that Ringium? And I'm yeah. almost, I'm 99% sure it, it was. Yeah, Blue oh. Waves. It's called Hillier's launch at Chelsea, probably about four or five years ago now. And there's also one called Big Blue, which is yeah, also Blue. out there. And that is also from the, from the same garden. It came from the seedlings at Dove Cottage Garden. So- Do you know, um, do you know one called Zabellii? Yes, cross yeah. Zabellii. That's mm. a very good blue as well. That's an Alpinum Zabellii cross. And it's quite an old cross. It goes back into the early years of the 20th century. Yeah, yeah. And it is a very, 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 very good um, uh, plant. Mm. In fact, there's another one, isn't there? Um, I don't know whether I'll be able to remember it, but there is another hybrid as well. I think it's Oliverianum. It's Oliverianum. Yeah, yeah. But the thing about these um, seedlings from Dove Cottage is they seem to have hybrid vigour and they make big clumps. So when you get a plant, you you know, you give it a sunny open position. And once it's established, it will be drought tolerant and you will get a really big show of the blue um, thimbles through August and July. I remove them. I don't want mine to sell seed. Uh, I want to keep the varieties. So I won't, once they go brown, I cut them down. But the foliage is also very good. 
So, um, you know, I think oryngiums are really good news in a wildlife garden, especially now we're getting drier summers. And I also grow a lot of astrantias. And, and this one is called Jill Richardson. And Jill Richardson, it's Jill Richardson Group now. She lives over in Bourne on a farm um, near Bourne in Lincolnshire. And she's a great snowdropper. So I, I have email contact with Jill quite often in snowdrop time. And everybody likes these really, really dark ones. And they do flower at this time of year. And you can see the ring of brats here and the tiny flowers, which are really good. There were butterflies on this this morning, actually. But um, I, got, I grow a lot of them in the garden. And again, I, they can be a bit of a nuisance and sell seed. And um, mm. I planted a lot of plants of shaggy, but it's, it, I always say it's never shagged in my garden, if you know what I mean. <laughs> It's never had this enormous, big, white thing that Marjorie Fish used to get about four inches across. But it has got these wonderful green tips. And um, there's various other ones. Um, this is a very good one. This is a sterile one called Buckland. And that will flower for weeks and weeks and weeks and really keep your hoverflies happy. So uh, I, I, I'm sort of big on umbellifers. Um, Estranches, I think for the first time in my garden, I had one lovely big clump and I can't remember the names. I think one of them might be shaggy. Now I've got two next to each other, which I'm enjoying all the more for having two different shades. So if you haven't got your Estranches intermingling, I fully recommend it. I'm loving that this year in my garden. Yeah. But also talking of snowdrops, I must say a massive thank you to the lovely Dean Croucher who sent me not only diggory, but wasp in the post oh, over lovely. the last few weeks. So... <laughs> I've got my aquatic baskets out and I've attempted to, you know, house them and make them happy and keep them safe. Only time will tell how my... Keep them in the ground. Yes, my new forays oh into um, mm. snowdrop growing will go. But I am extremely mm. grateful because diggory and wasp were kind of right there up there on the wish list. But in my first season, I didn't dare buy them. <laughs> um, to go just pop back to Astrantias for a minute... Um, Roma is probably the best sterile one, which was um, introduced by Pete Uldolf. And there aren't many Astrantia species, and they're all quite closely related. And when closely related species hybridize, they produce a pollen incompatibility that makes them sterile. And when plants are sterile, they go on flowering and flowering and flowering, and they don't produce any nuisance seeds. So Buckland and Roma, you know, would be the way to go for people. And Roma has to be micropropped, but it's still out there. And you what about Ruby the... Wedding Vow? Well, Ruby Wedding is, it, um, I think, was a seedling from Hadspen Blood. Yeah, I think I think it's being seed raised. I could be completely wrong, but it is very pretty. It is mm. a lovely thing. I think you just have to when you go to plant sales. I always I, I never look at the names. I look at the flowers, and if I like it, I buy it because you know um, it's a good piece of advice. For, anything by name you know it, it, it's the same with snowdrops I never look at a snowdrop's name I concentrate on the flower and if I like it I pick it up and then I think oh I've got this and I put it down again but if I haven't I buy it <laughs> and I actually I think looking at, at buying certain things in flower is really wise it's lovely to go and buy just a you know you know the plant you know you want it yes. and you feel like a great plants person that you're buying this nothing to look at green clump um but i've i've made the mistake in the past i've bought things partially based on pictures or written descriptions and then they've not quite been what i'd imagined or sometimes roses i bought the exact same rose that my mother has in her garden but mine is nowhere near as beautiful so i think <laughs> certain things i will just have to yes. buy in flower yeah, yeah that's, i think some things that's true for but things like phloxes and later flowering stuff when people grow them in pots, by the time you get to sort of August, July, August, they're looking really miserable. Yeah. And I think it, it, it put people buy, off buying phloxes, whereas I would rather buy my phloxes in the spring when they're getting, you know, just getting going and put them in. So I, I have a sort of divided view on it. Yeah. We need the plants that you must buy when they're in flower so you can see what you're getting. Yes. Like the yeah, poor person who um who ordered their wisterias and they were nowhere near the colour they wanted. Oh, you know? I know. Yes, I mean, I always tell people to buy witch hazels in flower, so you can see what you're getting. Yeah, but then other um, things. You're right. Shall I go on. on or not? Yes, one hundred percent. Um. So when we were talking about um 
um, insect friendly plants. One of the things I grow uh, a lot of in my garden are scabious. And um, this is a plant called Nautia macedonica, um, which I once chose in a list of 50 of my favorite garden plants. And I got letters because people said, how dare you choose that plant? It sells seeds all over my garden. Um, but if you don't get that sort of level of rich uh, ruby red in May from many plants. And because it flowers in May, it fills the gap between the spring bulbs and the tulips and the summer perennials. So I still rate it uh, Nautia uh, Macedonica. It isn't a native, but the one that you actually see in verges is um, Nautia arvensis, which is the blue one. And um, I was very surprised to read in British Wildlife, um, which is a wonderful magazine that comes out every month, uh, British Wildlife. And somebody had written about it because this blue scabious, which used to be so ubiquitous on our verges, is actually declining really, really fast. And I found the reason very, very interesting uh, because it's ants that distribute the seed of Nautia arvensis. And they are attracted to the seeds because they have a sticky coating. They do it with other things like cyclamen. And then they roll it along the ground. But once the sticky coating's gone, they, they just leave it where it is. A bit like a child with a crisp packet. <laughs> you, know, you have to correct them and say, no, you can't leave that there. Um, so it doesn't travel very, very far. Now I grow Nautia arvensis in my garden borders because it, it flowers in um, very willowy, pale blue, flowers in um, uh, sort of June, July time. And then you can rip it up in handfuls and the plant will still come back from the deep rootstock. So, it, and then it will get another flush of flowers. So um, I needn't worry too much about it self-seeding all over the garden, not like Nautia Macedonica, which does do it. But I've also got these uh, other sort of, hybrids which are called melton pastels and they do sell seed and they come in lots of different colors so you get these uh, different pinks that pop up in the garden and um, you do have to take the the heads off them uh, so you get lots of different pinks coming up and mauvey blues and then uh, these are also very very good for hoverflies and bees and butterflies in fact if i had to choose one plant above all others for a, a natural gardener, I would probably say scabious, you know, is it. And this little job here, I have to make sure I've got the right one. Yes, I have. Um, is our wild scabiosa columbaria, which I grow from Chilton seeds. And I use that a lot on border edges because it's so resilient and you get these wonderful long stems of flowers. And I'm just gonna show you two thistles. Except I don't think you'll be able to see the difference in the colour under these lights. This is sterile and it's Circeum rivulari atra purpureum. And in the garden, it's ruby red and it doesn't set seed and it flowers in flushes because that's what sterile plants do. But this one, people might not know, is called Trevor's Blue Wonder. And this is not quite so well behaved. It can roam because it's got some heterophilous blood in it but it's a really bluey color. And uh, these are the plants that are really pulling in the insects in the garden at the moment. That whole list of plants, they're just so important for everybody to, to actually try and include at least some of them in their gardens to help with pollinators yeah. and, and hoverflies. And I think it's very interesting what you said about hoverflies because we always try and, and, and encourage hoverflies around our vegetable patch. Yes. Uh, as well as, you know, as well as other places. Yes. And obviously our vegetable patch, we have a kind of, well, it was a path that I sort of just gradually tickled a fork into, a gravel path. Yes. And, the, and the gravel paths have become a gravel bed. Um, and so we have lots of those sort of things growing in it. Yeah, it's really, really good to pull them in because they mm. will look for colonies of, of aphids close to where they're foraging. And I always grow um, a single um, African marigold called burning embers near my runner beans. Yeah. Um, I, uh, and it does seem to keep them clear. I don't yeah. have, I've got quite a lot of black fly on my broad beans because um, uh, I think it's our, It's where we are. You know, the black bean aphids, they roost in uh, shrubby plants 
um, particularly dogwoods. And then they go on to the first uh, legume they can find. And it's always the broad bean. Mm. But we're, we're, we've got a lot of ladybirds on there. We've got a lot of ladybird larvae on there, which I'll try and photograph for you. Uh, so they will dis- they will disappear. And obviously, being a natural gardener, I don't spray. And actually, I wouldn't want to spray my the things I'm eating anyway. No. I want I want to live to a hundred. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the right path. <laughs> Hello. Oh, <laughs> she disappeared. <laughs> I don't know what happened, but that was very funny. <laughs> I think I must have pressed leave meeting to continue. Hello. Hello. You're looking very slim and trim and everything. Oh, well, I think, hello, Alan. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Doesn't Val Ooh. look slim? I don't know. I can't see her yet. <laughs> I have a thing where I go out and I have a slice of cake. I seem to put on a pound, whereas I live with somebody who can eat for England and is six foot six tall. Mm. People worry about him being thin. <laughs> yeah. And don't you just hate them? <laughs> I love how we've all got annoyingly slim significant others. Peter could hide behind a flipping lamppost and he eats so much more chocolate and everything than me. It's not fair. No, it's rotten, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it absolutely is. rotten. <laughs>